Welcome to the Antiques Masterclass. I'm Addison Gelpie and today we've got Lawrence Mitchell who's going to be talking about Mycin, how to spot a fake, how to spot a good quality piece from a, um, a bad piece. So Lawrence, really interesting lecture that you're um, going to talk about today. So please do tell us, thank you so much for well, coming along. As you know, t today Mycin is one of the world's leading brands. But there's a very, very good reason it's become the leading brand in Paulston because it's over 300 years old and no other manufacturer of porcelain other than the Chinese has that status. But Meissen also gave itself a problem and that was that as soon as it uh, began manufacturing porcelain, others tried to take away from them the secret. And of course, 50 years later, there was porcelain being made in other German cities, in France, in Paris, at Sèvres, Germany, Berlin, and countless British factories, and of course, all copying Meissen designs. So, how do you know what is genuine Meissen? Well, back in 1722, Meissen decided to put a trademark on their porcelain. Um, and that is the cross source mark, which I'm going to be showing you in a moment. Mm -hmm. But this is the man, his name is Botka, and he was <laughs> the one who invented um, porcelain. And this is one of his very, very first pieces, which is not so much porcelain, but it's made out of the stoneware. Mm -hmm. And it was made between 1710 and 1712. He's a, pretty, he's a pretty stern looking gentleman, isn't he? He was a very stern looking gentleman, but there is a, a. But unfortunately, because he was held in captivity, Augustus the Strong, who was the founder of Mycen, couldn't let him go. Dare someone else come along and take away his prized possession? Okay. Because really, that is what Botka was. It was his prized possession. Okay. And he unfortunately turned to drink, and that's perhaps why he's looking a bit stern. Right. So, so anyway, what I'm going to be talking about, as you see here, are tips on searching out the hidden dangers of collecting. I'm also called the Meissen Man because of a website, which I've got called themeissenman.com, which is really effectively a library about everything you've ever wanted to know about Meissen porcelain collecting. That is collecting antique Meissen, not modern Meissen. Okay. But Meissen going up to about uh, 1930. So. I'm going to be looking at the Meissen trademark, copies, fakes, quality, condition, investment, and caring for your collection. In fact, caring for your collection, if you don't know how to care for the collection, then you shouldn't even be collecting, full stop. So here is the Meissen trademark, and um, I believe this was actually taken from the Meissen website, and it's very, very important to know uh, uh, that that's the Meissen.com uh, website, that this AR mark, is the mark for Augustus the Strong. And it is by far the most important mark, but it's also the most copied of all the marks. And we're actually going to be seeing one or two pieces later on uh, where a lady in the 19th century actually made use of his Augustus Rex mark. Her name was Helena Wolfson. So she copied the mark and particularly where my concern is all the people who buy and sell online, unless they know it is mice and porcelain, please, I beg them not to describe it as mice and type or mice and Dresden, mice and AR. But we'll come on to that soon. Is that one of the earliest marks there? Sorry. That is one, that is one of, not necessarily one of the earlier marks, but it was made in the um, sort of, uh, 1720s, but it went on some of his the, his own personal yes. pieces, okay. which actually have his own uh, personal mark, nor, uh, which was on the base. So, so really and truly, what the marks that collectors should really be looking at are this mark here, this mark here, which is marked with the dark king spirit, and this one with the star. These are basically all standard Meissen marks. This one was uh, the only 20th century mark that really and truly collectors should be looking to purchase if they want to purchase 20th century Meissen because it's wonderful quality. And quality is so very important. Please, on later pieces after 1972, Meissen put this word on. But 
on the whole, most porcelain with the word Meissen on it is not genuine Meissen. And any Meissen cross source with this curved mark where the cross source is going inwards, that is generally 20th century or fake Meissen. Okay. And we'll, go, we'll look at that as well. Okay. So uh, we're going to go back now on to... Um, oh, sorry, going the wrong direction. <laughs> Um, so anyway, these are the very, very early pieces that were made at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, th this one would have been part of Augustus the Strong's collection, um, or yes. of a type. You, you can't stand up, Lawrence, because you, you just... You just oh, sorry, I didn't realise that, okay. No, it's alright. If you just go back to the authenticity slide, Okay. And then from there and say, now we're going to go on to Meissen, so, so or whatever you're going to talk okay, about. Okay, fine. All right. Okay, I didn't realise okay. that. Okay. <laughs> you, you've got to stay sitting down. You can point, but otherwise you've got the whole screen. Okay, fine. I didn't realise. Okay, thank you. Right. Now so, we're going to... All right. Wait. Okay. So I'll say three, two, one. Click. Let me just go cut to that slide. Okay. Three, two, don't, Lawrence, talk for a couple of seconds before you flip the slide, okay? Okay, all right. Three, two, one. Now we're going to look at early 18th century Meissen porcelain, particularly at the mark. These pieces represent some of the very early pieces. They are tea wares. Tea wares were the earliest forms of Meissen porcelain, and they would have been uh, made in the early 1720s, so these pieces date from about 1725, remembering that the cross mark was first put on in 1722. You, the KPM mark is extremely rare, extremely valuable, but people, private people, who think they've got a piece of mice and are unlikely to have it unless they come from royal descent. What does KPM mean? Um, Connexe Porcelain Manufacturer. Okay. Thank you. Another very, very important thing, if we look at the cup and saucer on the top left hand side, what often happens is that cups get put with saucers, but one can see there's a D, the D is upside down, but both on both the cup and both the saucer. There was no um, practical reason which way a cross saucer mark was applied or a, the D, which was the painter's. Marks. So, by having a D on the cup and saucer means that they were both by the same artist. And, and this one on the right hand side is also another different type of cross source mark, but again genuine, dating from about 1725. Now, if we look at these cross source marks, these are typical cross source marks dating from the 19th century. That is between 1850 and 1880. One of the things you've got to understand about the cross source mark, it was painted by hand. So every single person who was employed in actually painting the cross source mark would have painted it differently. Mm -hmm. So even on a pair, a pair of figures, for instance, which might have the identical painter's numbers, don't necessarily have to have identical painted cross source mark. And this here, the, in, there's an incised B and a number 8, that's, which is better off seen the 2728, is actually the model number. And that's another very good way of telling genuine Meissen, that it has a model number and it has a painter's number as seen on the middle photograph. That's the painter's number. All these three factors are very important in recognising genuine compared to fake. Again, here are some more marks, different types of marks on the porcelain. Now, when we go on to this mark, the, the, you will notice there is an indentation through the mark. On this one, there are two underneath the marks, mm -hmm. and the same, uh, mm -hmm. these are just larger versions of this particular piece. And the problem is, uh, this, the two photographs on the top left-hand side were actually a figure and basically what's happened, the yellow is actually original. 
but somehow got caught up in the firing. So what Meissen would have done, they would have decided that this is not a perfect piece of Meissen that they can sell. So they would have put these two lines going through it to indicate that it was second. So it would go into their second shop as opposed to their main shop. Okay. This is another version of the um, cross holes mark also with a cancellation but here the cancellation had actually been cut into the glaze. Now also one of the problems uh, and one of the um, issues that Meissen had around about 1750 with many of the uh, competition being so high is was when they first started to introduce this uh, cancellation of the cross tools trying to enhance business so often there was no real reason other than financial for putting this cancellation mark on. But I'd actually like to look at the source boat there and we'll actually have a look at this. This is dates from about um, 1760 and um, it has a cross source mark and very interesting it has a purple line going through the mark. So this is one of the earliest cross swords with cancellations. You don't see cancellations so much on 18th century Meissen. It's more prevalent in the 19th century. Now, when one looks at quality, and quality is very important. Um, I actually um, took this photograph at the auctioneer Sorders, so they actually allowed me to, uh, to do this for this class. This is not a good quality Meissen group. And it is, and this group actually, and this mark actually belongs to this particular group. So perhaps the line, this cancellation was put on because of the inferior quality of the period. In the first half of the 19th century, the uh, management were going through hard times. So their focus wasn't uh, bringing out outstanding quality. And so this dates from about um, 1850. I'm going to show in a moment some very fine quality of Meissen, the very, very best quality Meissen that was made in both the 18th century and 19th century. So here we do, how do you recognise quality in the 18th century and the 19th century? Now, the figure on the left is the most valuable Meissen figure ever sold in Christie's I think it was 2006, and it made just under half a million pounds. Wow. Equally as rare is this group, but it would cost about a tenth of the price. Now, again, this is a teapot which dates from about 1740, 1750, often when they became damaged, as is here. Uh, a metal mount would be put on. Now, looking at this uh, coffee pot on the right-hand side, uh, painted in the mariner of Holt, about circa 1725, 1730, a coffee pot recently sold in Bonhams for 85,000 pounds. Now, much of what is seen today in plenty of collectors, collections, is this quality Meissen. Now, it's, if you just bring it, it's the uh, two, if you bring the two figures on the, um, that one, and... Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Natasha. So this is, and that one. So this figure in my left-hand side is very, very typical. What Augustus the Strong, uh, when he originally asked Candy to make figures, he Cantor had to make figures in the manner of everyone who worked for the emperor. This is a gardener's figure, male gardener's figure, and particularly of this quality that was made in the middle of the 18th century. This figure dates from about 1750. Now, this figure, which has some minor restoration to the flute, would cost you, if you were interested in buying it, about £1,500. Now, if we're looking at this other the group, sorry, one other thing I wanted to show you. If you look at the base, 
and you probably can't see the cross holes mark, but there's a very, very pale cross holes mark. There are two types of bases found on mycin, those that are glazed and those that are unglazed. And often with unglazed bases, the mark can wear off. Looking at this second piece, this group, right. Now, very interestingly, the mark, it doesn't really look like a mycin cross holes mark because it's barely visible. It is a very, very tiny mark, but this is what they did. This, the particular, that piece there of the Harlequin would probably have a similar cross swords, exactly the same as this little cross swords on the side. So the cross swords that were actually put on early mycin on figural porcelain was actually on the side, or it could be to the left, not in the front. Just talking about one other thing, which I was going to talk to you later about, but since I've got this figure in my hand, it's fraud. I bought this figure 35 years ago. At that time, I didn't really understand much about porcelain. I had to learn by my mistake. I didn't realize that there was another cherub actually sitting on the left side of this vase. It's been restored very carefully. So in some respects, it's been restored with fraudulent intentions, and I've been the unlucky one. But even so, a group like this can be bought for a few hundred pounds, and is a great example of a mid 18th century Mycin group. If you wanted to buy a perfect one, you'd be buying a vase which would have a cover on top, and you'd probably have to pay between three and four thousand pounds. Still very beautiful though, Lauren. It is very beautiful, but the <laughs> different, main differences between 18th century and 19th century is that the porcelain is, um, is more subtle. 19th century is brighter, it's sharper in detail, but the differences you're dealing with in the 18th century, basically vegetable materials. When it comes to the 19th century, it's man-made materials. Course, yeah. So we're looking at quality. This is the absolute finest of quality that you can possibly find on later 19th century mycin. The very best quality was made round about 1880. Now I'm going to be showing two pieces, one made in 1880, one made in 1890. And, and actually, because there were changes in the production, this was a time when there was such tremendous demand that mycin actually had to make changes in the production. But what happened as a result was the quality went down. Very slight, very subtle, but I'm actually going to be showing it to you in a moment. But if we look at these, this is actually lace work. Today you've got to be very, very careful because this lace work is faked. And, um, and it might look identical, but it really depreciates the value. And um, this la lace work is very, very hard to, re to replicate for most restorers. A restorer who is really going to spend time rep replicating this uh, lace work can spend several days and that could cost many hundreds of pounds which can main, mean that it's very uneconomical. <coughs> so this is really the very finest of 19th century. You've got this wonderful pair of uh, vases which stand about uh, three feet high. This lovely pair of parrots this snowball vase, clock, and group to the left. Now I'm actually going to be showing you these examples of 19th century. This is my example of mine, the work of Lotharitz. Lotharitz was the chief modeler and manager of the factory towards the end of the 19th century. And he was responsible for the most magnificent of pieces and the finest quality. So if we're going to have a look at those at the, at the parrot. Here is a wonderful quality example. When one looks at the leaves on a piece this size, one begins to appreciate. Also, there's a very good cross source mark to the base. 